Hi, Classics folks. Um, it's me, and I'm recording uh, this video. If I'm not looking straight into the screen, it's because I'm trying to make sure it's actually recording, which apparently it is. Um, so, yeah, it's Sunday afternoon. As you can see, I am still in my Sunday vest, and uh, this is the way that we're going to operate uh, for the foreseeable future. Now, I know a lot of you have questions about what's going on and when campus is open again and all that stuff but like the short answer is nobody knows no one knows and uh if i knew i would certainly tell you um and i, I presume that if someone else knew that they would certainly tell you but uh as of right now this is how we're going to go forward so we're going to we're going to be talking about sophocles Oedipus the king today as you can see I'm in my kitchen this is my fridge. Uh, that's my microwave. Um, so <laughs> this is just the way that things are. Now, so as we go through this particular lecture, um, you can see that I don't have a chalkboard here because um, most people don't in their house. But um, so my little solution to that is that when th there is anything of relevance that comes up, that I am going to write it down on a piece of paper like this. And I will leave it up long enough for you to transcribe it, but don't forget this is on video, so you can always go back and uh, look things up or pause and rewind or any of that stuff. Um, uh, so having said that, let's get right into the text. Um, so we're dealing with Sophocles. Sophocles was born in 496. And dies in 406 BCE. So 496 to 406 BCE. So yeah, 90 years old. Pretty good, huh? So much for lifespan in the ancient world. Um... He was um, he was a member of the establishment class and uh, got all of the um, advantages and privileges that came with being a member of the advantagement class uh, uh, of the sorry excuse me uh, she sells she sells by the seashore all the privileges and advantages that come with being a member of the of the privileged class in that he got the best education. The year of his graduation, he graduated top of his class. Um, there was a, um, every year, I think I've talked to you about this before, but uh, every year in Athens, they had a public ceremony for all of the boys who had turned 18 or were going to turn 18 within that calendar year. And uh, um, Sophocles led the procession. So he was, you know, the, he was the guy uh, that everybody knew about. He served as a general, strategos. It's a word you should already have in your notes from Thucydides. Um, and uh, apparently didn't do all that well, but, uh, you know, he did hold the position. And he also served as the treasurer, state treasurer for Athens, which basically by default made him the treasurer for most of the Mediterranean region, um, as at that time Athens was in the beginnings of squeezing its allies for their assets. Um, he was widely celebrated uh, as a poet. He was the most easily, easily the most popular uh, writer of tragedy uh, in his day. Uh, it's not even close. Sophocles won something like 27 first prizes, uh, which is more than the combined total for both Aeschylus and Euripides. So we've already read Aeschylus and talked about Aeschylus. We're going to read Euripides next. Uh, but they basically barely cracked double digits, and uh, uh, Sophocles just trumps them all. Um, his popularity would continue 
um, in certain circles into the next century. He was the philosopher Aristotle's favorite poet. Aristotle, in his uh, treatise on tragic poetry, which is we call the Poetics, um, in that it's pretty clear that uh, he views Oedipus, well, Sophocles in general, but Oedipus the King in particular, as an ideal of the way tragedy should be written. And there are reasons for that, and we'll get into that as the as we go through the conversation. Um, uh, what else do I want to talk about with Sophocles? Uh, yeah, I mean, he was fortunate enough to die between 90, uh, before the actual fall of Athens in 404. Um, fortunate enough to die seems like an odd phrase to use, but... Uh, I used it, so it's out there. Um, and uh, he was involved with uh, a lot of very conservative political movements towards the end of the Peloponnesian War. So in the starting in the 4, 411, 410, 49, in that range, um, he became a proponent of getting rid of the democracy. So... You know, it was a thing, and it happened. And I'm not trying to pass value judgment on it, but uh, you see what I'm saying. Um, so, uh, all right. So, well, let's talk about Oedipus the King. When we talk about Oedipus the King, the first thing we have to talk about is the play's title, right? So we know this play in English as Oedipus the King. But that title is, uh, it's not, it doesn't correspond to the actual way that the Greeks referred to the play. That title, Oedipus the King, is a translation of the Latin Oedipus Rex, which some of you may have heard. So, King and Rex, right? These two things mean basically the same thing. What do they mean? They mean an authority who gets his power because he got it from his dad. So it's hereditary. Uh, I am king because God or the gods like my family more than they like your family. And therefore, my family and I get to rule over all of you. Um, so divine right is another way of, another phrase, another term that can be used here. Um, we're kings because God or the gods have chosen us to be such, right? So it's hereditary. And at the same time, well, okay. So when you look at these terms, right? King and Rex, they, 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 they bring with it this, this connotation of having been uh, handed down from the gods, having been handed down over time, right? So it's, it's just, it's, it's what we talked about with uh, Zeus and Prometheus Bound and the idea of a priori authority, right? So the, 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 the king or the Rex is that because of some unstated quality that a particular family has that other quality that other families don't have. Now, the Greeks had a word for this. That word <coughs> is, let me back this up, sorry, new at this, so please bear with me, Basileus. <coughs> So the Greek word basileus corresponds to the Latin word rex, corresponds to the English word king, which is this concept of authority because you just are chosen and given it's given to you and uh, it passes down to your son, usually, sometimes daughter on occasion, um, but usually son. Um, these, this is not the way the play was known to the Greeks themselves. To the Greeks, what they called this play
was Oedipus Tyrannos. Wait, so let me fix this for a second. There we go. It's Oedipus Tyrannos. Now, I've already talked uh, for a minute about this word uh, when we did Thucydides uh, and the idea that, the, the, that um, in pure political theory uh, in Greek thought, the Tyrannos was not necessarily a bad thing. There could be good ones, there could be bad ones, just like there were good kings or there were bad kings. Um, or there could be good elected leaders or bad elected leaders. So it wasn't, it wasn't the way that we use the word tyrant nowadays, um, even though the word does derive from, from this word. You can't call somebody a tyrant nowadays and mean it as a compliment. Uh, it's automatically uh, pejorative, insulting. But what the Tyrannos is, He's like a king in the sense that he's a single, and I'm using, I keep saying he, and that's just the reality of things. I can't off the top of my head think of a female Tyrannos. She wouldn't be called Tyrannos. She would be called Tyranna. Um, I, but I, I could be wrong on that. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not entirely positive. But if so, there are few and I'd be surprised if there's more than one, put it that way. So they're he's, the dudes. Um, they're like a king because they're singular rulers uh, within the city-state. They have authority. They have absolute authority in the same way the king... Oh, my hat seems all kind of weird. Maybe it's just the camera angle. I don't know. Let me see. Okay. Um, uh, it's not... It, so they have singular authority... Um, within the city-state in the same way that the king does. and uh, But the, there are differences. They're not there by divine authority. How does the Tyrannos get power? The Tyrannos gets power by uh, seizing it, basically. Um, yeah, you go out, you raise your private army, you come in, you occupy the sacred parts of the city, you set up shop, people get scared, and then you're in charge all of a sudden. Um, and in particular, Athens has a, had a history of of, uh, tier, uh, of the Tyrannos. Um, the plural is Tyrannoi, but don't worry, I won't require you to know that. Um, uh, <clears throat> so Athens themselves. So this is this is what I'm working to towards with the title of this play. Is that if you think back to our discussions. Uh, of Aeschylus, you will remember that ancient tragedy has roots in two uh, sort of, um, uh, I guess I would say, founts of uh, influence here. Uh, the political sphere... And the religious sphere. I will get onto the religious aspects of Oedipus the King in just a moment, um, but I'm not done talking yet about the political elements of it. So the year that Oedipus the King was produced was probably 427 BCE. 427. 427. That should be pretty straightforward, right? Um, the, the date is disputed. There are some scholars who put it back to like 430, 429, and there are some who move it forwards towards 425. It doesn't matter all that much. The point is, is that the play was produced during the first phase of the Peloponnesian War. When Athens was winning, but when, but things were still dicey. Why were things dicey? Things were dicey in Athens because they had just come through the plague. Why else were things dicey in Athens? 
things were dicey in Athens because they had just lost their major political leader in Pericles. You will remember we read some of Pericles' speeches uh, from Thucydides in the history of the Peloponnesian War. Um, at the same time, of course, Athens is uh, Athens and, 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 and her power are still very closely bound up in, and in in even indeed the Athenian citizens take their identity from the navy. So again, 427, the plague ends, plague, I mean, that's, <laughs> was, it definitely was not the coronavirus. Uh, <laughs> uh, the, right, we read the description in Thucydides and talked about this in class, so I don't feel the need to necessarily go over it again right now, um, because if I have to go over it again, that means you did not take good notes the first time around. Um, So that's Athens in 427, right? That's their social reality in 427. Remember, the Spartans invade every springtime. All the Athenian citizens who live outside of the actual city limits have to come into the city in the springtime. Um, and so there's overcrowding, and there's just a general sense of, like, things aren't normal, basically. Um, and so... When we turn from that to the way that Sophocles deals with the myth of Oedipus, and I'm going to come back to the myth of Oedipus in just a second, because we do have to look at the larger myth of Oedipus. Um, how does Sophocles frame this whole story? Well, the first problem is that there's a plague. And the second problem, why is there a plague, is because of the death of Laius, their king. So you can see part of the genius of this work is, is how Sophocles brings his audience, his contemporary audience, and it, like, you know, maybe it's more relevant now than it might have been two years ago or five years ago to us, but... He brings his contemporary audience right into the action, right? Just everything that's happening on the stage, the plague, <clears throat> the loss of their beloved leader is mirrored in what, in, in what Athenians can feel in their own city. They've just come through a plague and they've just lost their beloved leader. So what about the Navy? Well, Sophocles does not leave that out. Frequently throughout the play, Sophocles makes reference to, or I'm sorry, compares the city of Thebes to a ship. He talks about, you know, the city being a ship all the time, um, uh, which is, you know, <laughs> can, like it's definitely a way to, to bring an Athenian audience in. It doesn't really have a lot to do with the original myth of Oedipus. Um, but he, he, he employs these metaphors constantly. Um, so I'll give you a quick example here. <clears throat> okay. So this is something that Jocasta says. And don't worry, we're going to come back to Jocasta and talk about her in just a minute. But this is something Jocasta says. This is at line 924 of the Lattimore and Green translation, um, if you need to look it up. Uh, but this is what she says. She says, Now, when we look to him, we are all afraid. He's pilot of our ship, and he is frightened. Okay, well, it's... Kind of British English. We don't speak of pilots of ships. We talk about the captains of ships, but it's the same thing. He's the one in charge. He's the man who gives the orders from the helm, from the bridge. Right. He's in charge of the ship. Right. The actual Greek word that's used here 
I know you guys are going to love me for giving you a lot of Greek words. But get used to it. The Greek word that's used here is... Hold it up so you can see it. It's too close. Kubernetes. All right, so you're like, what the hell does that word mean, right? Well, let me just break this down for you. In Latin, this word becomes gubernator. No, see, they look a lot alike, right? Some of you already have guessed where I'm going with this, because in English, this word becomes governor. So in a sense, our, our political language has not evolved all that much. Really, we might have lost track of the etymological roots of these things, but but they still, you know, they're all related. So, that, I mean, that's just one example of the way that uh, uh, Sophocles pulls. And there's lots of other passages that I could read out to you uh, where the ship is described as, a, you know, being at sea and being hit by waves and, um, uh, you know, tossed around, all that stuff. And even in the very last passage, the chorus says, Behold Oedipus, uh, who was once the greatest of all men, and uh, now he's been washed overboard by the waves. So, again, so this is just this goes back to the, the point where, again, what, what I'm talking about here, just to be clear, is that there is a very real political element to Oedipus the king. And when I talk about the political element, I'm talking about the way that Sophocles invites the whole polis to enter into the action of the play. Okay. That's a political, or one of the political aspects of it. Um, I'll come, I'll, I will return to that um, towards the end of the lecture. Uh, because we still, I haven't wrapped up the conversation about the Basileus Tyrannos thing. Um, but I do want to move on to the mythic aspect um, before we come back to that. Um, there, are, uh, Oedipus's family uh, are part of a uh, long, uh, in myth, they're part of a, 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 an important family. They're, they come from Cadmus. Cadmus, we're going to read about Cadmus later um, in the semester, but... Uh, Cadmus was uh, the founder of Thebes, and then his children, and well, actually not his children, but his grandchildren, and then their children, and their children, and their children, all became rulers of Thebes. And uh, um, yeah, okay. So I'm all right. I'm sorry. I'm trying not to go too far down the myth, the myth hole right here. Um, uh, when we look at, when we think about the story of Oedipus, we can think uh, basically more clearly about his dad, Elias, uh, and his mom, Jocasta, who, before Oedipus was even conceived, received a prophecy that said, hey, if you have a son, that son will grow up, and that son will kill you, Elias, and then sleep with you, Jocasta. All right. Okay. So, Okay. So we'll put aside the WTF factor of that just for a second and, and, and look at that in the, co the larger context of Greek myth. The idea of sons overthrowing their fathers is throughout Greek myth and indeed throughout all, I would argue, Indo-European myth. Um, Freud made a lot of it and um, he might... I've had some true things to say. I don't know. I'm not the world's biggest Freud fan. But um, 
they <laughs> for whatever reason they decide to do it anyway and uh, Jocasta ends up pregnant Sophocles in Oedipus the king now the okay so here's the thing like when you look at when you look at modern presentations like the way that it's packaged in translation you'll see that there are three plays that come in one volume Oedipus the King, Oedipus at Colonus, and the Antigone. Oedipus the King, which you've read, so I don't need to tell you what it tells the story of, but it tells you the story of Oedipus as the ruler um, of Thebes and, uh, you know, his mom and her suicide and his blinding of himself and his exile, ultimately. Oedipus at Colonus tells us the story of Oedipus at the end of his exile with his daughter Antigone as they finally find their burial place. If you want to learn more about this play, take tragedy next semester. Same with this play, Antigone. Antigone tells the story of her return back to her home city uh, with the purpose of burying her brother who by decree of her uncle is denied burial because he, his uncle, who is now king, Creon, you know him, he's in the play, he's in Oedipus the King. Uh, uh, he's now king of, of, of Thebes. Uh, she returns home and, uh, and basically, against the law, buries her brother. So these plays are often presented as, as these are often, this is often referred to, whoops, sorry, mirror image, as the Theban trilogy, okay? Um, but they're not really a trilogy in any real sense. Uh, and so let me explain why. A trilogy, technically speaking, are three plays that were written to be presented at a dramatic festival in one year, in any, in any one year. That's what they called a trilogy. They all had to be done at the same time in the same year. It didn't mean that they had to follow plot sequence you know, it wasn't like Star Wars Episode 4, 5, and 6. didn't have to be. could be that way. It was okay for it to be that way. It was neither here nor there, whether they were or they weren't. But the problem with the, with the way people understand these plays today is that Antigone was written in 441 BCE. Oedipus the King was written probably, like I suggested earlier, around 427 Maybe or maybe a couple years earlier, maybe a couple years later, but you know, in the four twenties, in the late four twenties, Oedipus of Colonus wasn't written. It was the last thing that Sophocles wrote. That wasn't written until four o six. So they're not really a trilogy, even though they they engage with the same cast of characters. And even though we can, even though they survive, we can put them in a kind of a, a chronological order. And the amazing thing about the three plays is that the characters are remarkably different in each play. The, the Oedipus that we get to know in Oedipus the King is, to my reading, remarkably different from the Oedipus that we get to know in Oedipus of Colonus, for sure. Um, so, uh, yeah, what am I talking about? I forget what I was talking about. Oh, the general myth behind all of this. Right. So they decide to have sex anyway. Sophocles never gets into it, into why they did. Uh, we're going to read Euripides next. Euripides was not so, uh, let me see, let me think of the phrase here. He was not as socially cautious as Sophocles was. Uh, he was a bit more willing to take risks with norms and, uh, you know, accepted standards. And um, in Euripides' play, it's called the Phoenician Women. Um, again, it's a thing that we we do in the tragedy class. Um, in the Phoenician Women, Oedipus, or not Oedipus, <laughs> they're in there, Freudian slip, right? Uh, Euripides tells us that uh, what happened was that Laius got really drunk and they just, and then they did the thing. Um, 
So Euripides wasn't quite so fearful of that aspect of the myth, but in Sophocles, there's no no clear account as to why they might have decided to have a have sex. Um, anyway, they end up having a baby, a baby boy. And uh, on the birth of the baby boy, they remember the prophecy um, that has come to them and uh, decide that uh, it'd be better to get rid of the kid. And so what they do is they take the boy out to the mountainside. They, they chain his ankles together. Um, some accounts, they actually put a metal pin um, I guess between it, I guess, I mean, I'm sorry, I'm not a medical, I'm not an anatomist or a medical doctor, but I imagine what must be between his Achilles tendon and his tibia or his tarsals or whatever. And, uh, um, and they leave him there to die. Now they don't kill the baby. And a lot of people are like, why don't they just kill the baby? Well, because killing a baby, killing a, killing a child, would invite the wrath of the gods, whereas taking the baby... Okay, I know this is going to sound weird to you, but it's myth, okay? So, this is, remember, the logic of myth does not necessarily work the same way our, you know, scientific causal logic works today. So the idea here is that to actually kill the baby yourself with your own hands is, is to sin directly against the gods. But if you take the baby out and you leave the baby out in the woods or on the mountainside, then it's up to the gods. It's their choice. They can take care of the baby. If they want the baby to survive, it's their job. It's out of my hands, out of my hair. Right? So, I mean, <laughs> that's just, I'm sorry. That's just how it is in myth. Um, and uh, he's found there by one of the shepherds who is uh, a servant for Elias and Jocasta. And he takes mercy on the, on the child, and, but doesn't know what to do with it. So, he, but he has a friend who's a servant of the king and queen of Corinth. Uh, um, what the hell are their names? Uh, no, uh, it'll come to me in a second. I can't remember their names right now. Ah. Oh, all right, doesn't matter. Anyway, um, it'll come to me at one, at one point, as long as I stop thinking about it. Um, so he decided, because the king and queen of Corinth don't have any children. So he approaches his friend and says, hey, look, I found this baby. Why don't you take this baby, give it to the king and queen, and they can say it's their own baby. And that's what happens. And so the, the Corinthian shepherd takes it back to Corinth, and he gives it to the king and queen. Paul, uh, uh, Polybus and Merope, that's their names. Yes, I knew I was going to get it. Polybus and Merope. Um, and uh, they pass the child off as their own, not before giving the kid his name. Oedipus. Right? It's on the front of your book. I don't have to leave it up there too long. So they give him they give him his name Oedipus. Now, why do they call him Oedipus? What is this what what does this name actually mean? Well, generally speaking, Greek names tend to have meanings. Sometimes they're throwaway meanings, you know, um, uh, you know, like you know, you get named after your granddad, or you get named like Mr. Big Wealth, or you know, the beautiful Callista, the beautiful woman. Like, like, they're just sort of, you know, and we do the same thing um, in our cultural practice today. But when you look at Greek drama, there's a lot of times when names tell you a lot about what the poet wants you to understand about what's going on on stage. So I'm going to get into Oedipus's name. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do one part of it now, and I'll come back to the second part of it in just a minute. So you see this part, this Eid. So I know it looks like O E, right? But in Greek, when you got two vowels in a row, they're pronounced as one. So e Oedipus, right? 
that's the same as your, that's the root of your English word edema. Edema is a medical condition where water swells up in a particular joint. Okay, plants get edema, humans get edema, other animals get edema when they when they accumulate water on a joint. So this part, the the pus part of oedipus, is from the Greek word podos. Pos podos. Uh, depends on where it comes in the sentence. This is where we get our English word podiatry from. What is podiatry? Podiatry is the uh, uh, science of uh, doctoring the foot. So what Oedipus's name means at one level, it's not the only one, uh, it's not the only level. Nothing operates at only one level in this play. Um, but what Oedipus means here is swollen foot, which makes sense because probably when uh, he came with his legs chained or pinned together, uh, his feet were probably swollen, I would imagine. Um, so yeah, so he grows up. And uh, as he grows up, as he is uh, entering into his full manhood, he is at the attendance of a drinking party where someone gets drunk and tells him he's not, he's not really the son of Polybus and Merope. Which pisses him off. It makes, it, it, it really pisses him off. And, uh, So what is Oedipus's reaction? Oedipus's reaction is to take out, take off, run away. And where does he run away to? He run away. He runs away to Delphi. Sorry, I'm just getting ready. I'm not going to do one just yet. <laughs> um, so he runs off to Delphi to consult the oracle of. Now I'm going to do one. Uh, to the consult the oracle of Apollo. So he goes off to see Apollo at Delphi. I feel like I should put a .edu after Delphi or .gov or something. Uh, actually, no, that sounds like a good idea for a website to start up. Apollo at Delphi.com. Um, so why does he go? Why does he go to Apollo at Delphi? Because Apollo is known as somebody who can give knowledge. That is, that is one of Apollo's chief um, or principal attributes as a god. Um, if you think back to Prometheus Bound and you remember the last time that we were in class together, um, I talked about how Prometheus makes claims to all of the arts like math and law and music. The, all those, not, all, not everything that he names are directly associated with Apollo but half or more than half of them are. Um, and so basically in that speech, when Prometheus gives that speech, what he's saying is all these things that the Olympian gods claim the right to are things that I brought in the first place. Okay, well, that's that. We've already talked about that. Um, but when the new gods come in, when Zeus, with the help of Prometheus, by the way, anyway, already talked about that. Um, when Zeus comes into power, uh, Zeus is the a priori authority. Uh, he's the man on top. And, uh, but there's a gap between Zeus's authority and people obeying that authority because people aren't good with just like being top down, ordered around. Um, and so there has to be an intermediary between them. And that's what Apollo becomes. Apollo becomes this intermediary between the authority of Zeus and the way that people behave. 
so in that respect, he is what we call, and I know I put this board, word on the board already, but I'll write it out here again. He is the prophetes. So what does it mean that he's the prophetes? Um, there are a couple of things. I just unplugged my computer because it keeps going to sleep. So hopefully that'll solve the problem. We got two parts to this word. Fetes, I mean, I know I've already been through this, but I'll review it for you briefly. The fetes has to do with talking, speaking. Like as in our English word. Fatuous. If you don't know what it means, look it up. Um, but it's the pro part that really informs us here because it's the pro. So we think of, so we know, we can see that you can see the English word prophet here. I mean, that's clear to see, right? But that doesn't mean that his job is just to tell the future. I mean, I know that that's how we use that word, in, like, or how that word is received in English now. Um, so it's just not about, to, but in, in the, in this context, it's just not about, um, telling the future. There's more to it than that. It's that he, it's pro in the way that you do pro bono work as a lawyer, right? If you're pro something, you're on behalf of that thing, you're supporting that thing, you're representing that thing. And so the, the pro fetes, more so than speaking out in advance of time, actually the primary, I would argue, I'm sure that there are other people who would disagree with me on this particular topic, but I would argue that the, like the, the prime impact here is that uh, he's speaking on behalf of Zeus. He has the authority of Zeus. He's mediating between men and people for Zeus. So he's a truth teller. We're supposed to accept his word. We're supposed to take Apollo's word as true, right? Which is, of course, what ends up getting <laughs> Laius, Jocasta, and Oedipus eventually in trouble because they do not accept Oedipus's word as true, but that's a different story. So Apollo has, now the, when, when, when Odysseus flees from Corinth and goes to Delphi, Apollo has uh, a temple at Delphi. That's why he goes there. Right, it's the it was the most probably I mean arguably I would say probably the most important sacred site in the entire ancient world. I mean it was it, it, it prob I mean I don't know there's you can make arguments for other places but it was really important and uh, so he goes to Delphi to Apollo's temple. Now when you walked into Apollo's temple, all of Sophocles' audience would know. that when you walked through the entry of the temple, you walked under a big inscription. Before you, like, just as you were walking into the temple, you were confronted with this big uh, sign, if you want to call it that, but this big, it, was a, it would have been a stone inscription, a big stone inscription. And what it said was, the traditional translation is, know thyself. Which is an old English way of saying, know yourself, which is a, even more obscure way of saying is know who you are and the the know yourself um, inscription what that what that was meant to convey was that you needed to know who you were in your place in your family in your city in the larger context of Greek culture and in the even larger context of the cosmos as a whole so you know you're not an immortal. So don't act like one. Right? You know you are a citizen, so act like one. You know, you know you're a son. You know you're a daughter. You know you're a child. You know you're a father. You know you're a mother. So act like one. Know, know what is happening. Know who you are. Know, know what you're doing, right? Now the problem with all this is that 
I mean, I shouldn't say it's a problem, but the, one of the ironies, and I'm going to come back to irony before this video is over, uh, which I now realize is running awfully long, <laughs> but too bad, get used to it. Um, got nothing else to do, right? Um, the, uh, the irony with all of this is that when, when people went to Delphi to ask questions, so you went through, you went through like one part of the temple and then you made a sacrifice, and if the priests like your sacrifice, which is to say, which is to say, if it was a uh, rich enough sacrifice, then you were allowed to go into the next chamber, and when you went into the next chamber, what you did was you asked your questions to the priests who were there, and then the priests would go into another, the inner part of it, and they would put the question to the priestess. She was called the Pythia. Don't worry about that right now. We'll come back to it later in the semester when we do Ovid. Um, um, and then the Pythia would spout words. And according to all ancient accounts, her words were more or less nonsense. Um, and there have been many theories over the years about this. Um, but anyway, I, I'm not going to get into that right now. If you want to do that, do the, uh, Delphi course, uh, with, with, um, Professor Kellogg. It's an excellent course and you can get into great detail there. Um, and, uh, and then the priest would interpret the words and then he would come back out and give the message to you standing outside. Uh. So famously, the messages from the Oracle of Delphi were often, you know, that usually the priests like played the middle road. They, they were known for giving very ambiguous answers that could be interpreted in multiple ways, right? Well, that's not really the case with Eupis. I mean, it's kind of hard to, to misinterpret um, an Oracle that says you're going to kill your dad and sleep with your mom. I mean, that seems a bit straightforward, right? That seems like an easy thing. So Oedipus leaves Delphi and decides that he's not returning to Corinth because remember, he doesn't have any good reason at this stage to doubt the idea that Polybus and Merope are his real mom and dad. So as he's traveling, right, He comes to a crossroads. Now this, of course, is obviously not to scale. You can look these up on a map. You all have Google. Uh, Delphi, Corinth, and Thebes, right? So he's leaving Delphi, but he comes to this crossroads, right? He can go one way and go back to, go back to Corinth, or he can go another way and go back to Thebes. Or, or sorry, he doesn't know he's going back to Thebes, but, or, go, or take that road that go, heads north. Uh, and for clear reasons, he decides not to take the um, the road back to, 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 to Corinth because, you know, he's just been told he's going to kill his dad and sleep with his mom. So uh, he takes the North Road, and on his travels, uh, he's strolling along, and here comes this retinue of people, um, a dude in a carriage and a bunch of armed soldiers and Guy in the carriage says, get out of my way, I'm, I'm king of Thebes. And Odysseus says, get out of my way, I'm prince of Corinth. You know, I'm making this up, by the way, this is not in the text itself per se. Um, but I imagine that this is how it went down. And a uh, fight ensues. And um, it's rogue rage. Uh, but you can also see here, like, father, like, son going on. Right, neither of them wants to, neither of them wants to move aside for the other one which is why I made that little story up a second ago. Uh, and uh, he ends up killing everybody, including his dad, and all of his uh, bodyguards, all of his soldiers, um, except for one who runs away and hides. We'll come back to him in just a second. Um, so Oedipus makes his way back to um, Thebes, but on the way he has to deal with this monster, the Sphinx, who has been terrorizing the countryside 
um, and killing all the crops and preventing childbirth and you know just being a general nuisance as monsters um, can be. And uh, so uh, the thing about the Sphinx is that like there's only one way to kill her. She is a her. Uh, it's a uh, uh, usually depicted as the body of a lion with the head of a woman, uh, but that's not universal. There's other there's other sphinxes uh, with other iconographies, but you know that's the that's the one that, that, that took hold in European art for whatever reason. Um, so the sphinx is uh, the only way to defeat the sphinx is to answer the riddle of the sphinx, and the riddle of the sphinx is what walks on. Uh, four legs in the morning, three legs in the afternoon, and two legs at night. Um, and Oedipus answers the riddle. The answer, probably, as you all know, this is not a mystery, it's pretty well known, is a human being. It's a person, right? Uh, a man. Obviously not just a man. It's also a woman, but, you know, whatever. So a human being. And... Uh, um, The reason why that's the answer is because in the morning of your life, you're a baby, and the only thing that you can do is crawl. So you're an animal that walks on four legs. And then in the prime of your life, when you're, I don't know, whatever age you want to attach to, it's somewhere between the years of 18 and, let's say, um, 49, uh, you can still walk around on your own two feet. Uh, and so you go on two feet. And then when you're old, you have to have a cane. So you go around on three feet. So Oedipus solves a riddle, right? Destroys the Sphinx. Rescuing hero of Thebes is welcomed back and given Jocasta, uh, give, proclaimed the king because he saved the city, and given Jocasta the queen uh, as his wife. So it took me 40 minutes and 50 minutes, and I'm only at the start of Oedipus the King. So let me pick this up. Uh, let me pick the pace up here a little bit, and just I'm gonna just gonna hit some of the some of the thematic stuff. Trust me, I'm coming back to some of the stuff we already talked about. It wasn't for no reason. Um, I'll come back to it. Um, so Oedipus is hailed as the conquering hero. Problem is, there's now a new plague on the city because the king has been murdered and the murderer is in the city limits. Which means that in Thebes, there is what we call a miasma. Now this is also an English word that we still use in English. What it means is pollution. But the difference is, is that in the Greek concept of, of, of pollution, it's a thing that can be caused by moral misdoing that leads to physical suffering. So you do something wrong you do something the gods don't approve of, what's going to happen is that your whole community is going to suffer as long as you stay there or, or until you purify in some instances. So the miasma is, is, is it's a pollution that's introduced by a moral wrong that manifests itself in physical suffering. So for the Thebans, there's like, hey, Oedipus, you know, you got rid of the Sphinx. Maybe you can help us with this thing. And then Oedipus is like, yes, I can. Of course I can. I will find this killer even if he lives in my own house. No. I will, I will hunt for the killer even if, as if I was hunting for the killer of my own father. No. <laughs> so there's, in the first, like, 500 lines of the plays, there's all these all, there are all these lines of great irony. And I'm, I'll talk about irony in just a second. In fact, I'm going to write it on another piece of paper because I do not want to forget about talking about it. Um, 
and I'll, I'll I'll pull out particular lines in the play. I've already quoted a couple of them, but yeah. Uh, so Oedipus, but you have to understand here too that Oedipus is starting off this this investigation with very limited information. I mean, the first thing that happens is Creon comes back from Delphi, right? So from Apollo, so bringing trustworthy truth, that's not redundant, but yes, coming from the truth teller, and Creon comes back, and when Creon comes back, he's got, he's got um, victory garments on. He's wearing a wreath, and he's carrying a staff with uh, streamers on it. These are all markers of, of uh, success or victory in Greek iconography. Um, and uh, so he's got good news. And the good news is that, hey, I got what Apollo said was um, uh, if we find the killer of Laius and exile the killer of Laius, the plague will be lifted. So good news, right? Good news all around. All we got to do is, is like, do this investigation and find, the, find the, 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 the killer of Laius. And so Oedipus, you know, takes the lead on this, as he was asked to by the citizens of the city. Um, as they say to him, you are the greatest in all men's eyes. <laughs> For as long as you have eyes. <laughs> Again, another irony, another ironic statement. Um, and uh, so Oedipus begins his investigations. The first thing he does is he calls for the seer Tiresias. Um, Tiresias is a character that you should get to know because it's not the last time that you are going to encounter him. He is the um, kind of uh, proverbial. He's all he's in a million myths. Um, he's always old, uh, and he spans many generations. He's like the Gandalf of Greek myth, I suppose you could say. Uh, but. Uh, um, Tiresias comes, and Tiresias doesn't want to talk. He doesn't want to say what he knows, right? And so Oedipus loses his temper. Now, you will note that there is a pattern of Oedipus losing his temper over the course of the play. He lost his temper. He, he lost his temper with um, Laius at the crossroads, for one thing, which kind of set us down this whole road. Um, he... Uh, will later lose his temper, well, he's in the process of losing his temper with Tiresias, he will lose his temper with Creon, when the, when the shepherd, remember I talked about, now see, got to pay attention, the Corinthian shepherd returns uh, uh, to give his information, he doesn't want to talk, what does Oedipus do? He physically tortures him. So there's a pattern of Oedipus and his temper, that goes on here. He, he kind of sort of acts on the first thing that he hears uh, without weighing through other possible elements. So Tiresias comes, when he finally gets drags Tiresias back to Sinema. Tiresias is old, he's blind. We'll talk of, again, I'm, I'm not, I, let me, I know I'm already in danger of running over time here, but uh, uh, we'll come back to Tiresias at some point. He has a fascinating backstory in his own right. But Tiresias comes and he doesn't want to talk. And the reason why he doesn't want to talk is because he knows the truth. Why does he know the truth? Because he himself is a prophet of Apollo. So you see how Apollo is bound up in this whole process, right? And it's one approach to reading Greek tragedy. Well, it's not the only approach, but there's, it's a useful approach in that one way that you can understand or decipher what happens in Greek tragedy is by understanding what god or goddess kind of defines or overarches the work as a whole, right? So we read Prometheus Bound, and you have to read that through the lens of Zeus and Zeus's tyrant. Um, that's sort of the define like Zeus is, like, I know Hermes appears, I know Hephaestus appears, and other gods appear over the course of that play, but it's really Zeus, and Zeus's presence that, that kind of define that play. And Oedipus the king, it's Apollo and Apollo's presence, and in particular, it's Apollo and it's a specific association with knowledge. So what Tiresias tells Oedipus is you don't want to know these things.
You want these things to be kept in the dark. You want to be blind to these things. Because the truth is not good for you. Well, that's not good enough for Oedipus. He continues to provoke Tiresias through the course of their conversation, but to the point where Tiresias kind of just has enough and basically says, you're, you're the cause of the plague. You killed your dad. Your dad was Lias and you killed him and you're the cause, which of course Oedipus just stiff arms, right? Just he isn't, at this point, you know, that's not even, he thinks that Tiresias and Creon are in a, a, a little conspiracy with each other uh, to get rid of Oedipus so that Creon can become king and Tiresias can profit from being a prophet, uh, so to speak. So these are the key words. This happens at line 398. Um, well, the key line is line 398. I'm going I'm to read from a bit above that, okay? He says, and in the context of what I'm about to read, what Oedipus is saying to Tiresias is, Oh, oh, Mr. Prophet... What about when the Sphinx was here? What good were you when the Sphinx was here? That's the context of this. He says, For tell me, where have you seen clear Tiresias with your prophetic eyes? When the dark singer of the Sphinx was in your country, did you speak word of deliverance to its citizens? And yet, the riddle's answer was not the province of a chance comer. In other words, it shouldn't have been up to somebody who just showed up, right? The riddle's answer was not the province of a chance comer. It was a prophet's task. It was your job, Tiresias. And plainly, you had no such gift of prophecy from birds, nor otherwise from any god to glean a word of knowledge. But I came, Oedipus, who knew nothing, and I stopped her. Okay. Now you're talking to a prophet of Apollo here. But still, it gets worse. I, I. You won't, I mean, I'm reading this one passage out, but if you go back through the text, you will see the number of times that Oedipus uses what we call the first person singular. I, me, myself. He's constantly talking about himself. Like, it's like, which to a Greek audience, would impede your ability to actually know who you are. You can't, just, you can't just think about yourself as such. You have to understand yourself, but then you also have to understand yourself in relation to the people that are around you. Right? It's, it's, not, there's, it's not just like, no one knows me. Like, you know, it's, like, it's not like that. It's that you're part of a community. You're part of a culture. And yeah, you have to know your own private strengths and weaknesses, but you also know, have to know how those strengths and weaknesses fit into the community as a larger collective, too. Anyway, I solved the riddle by my wit alone. I'm going to write this down. Because it's, for me, it's the central line. I solved the riddle by my wit alone. Again, this is somewhere around line 398 in the text. And basically what Oedipus is doing here is he's saying, I didn't need Apollo. You rely on Apollo. You're Apollo's prophet. So why, why, why couldn't you work it out? I could do this by myself. I was smart enough to do this by myself. In other words, what he's doing is rejecting Apollo. And he's rejecting Apollo as the fount of things, things that we know 
not because we thought of them ourselves, not because we're smart, but because they're the sorts of things that we can only know because Apollo tells us. In other words, Apollo represents revealed knowledge. There are things that we can only know when Apollo reveals them to us, or as he reveals them to us. So, okay, there's two, two more things here that I want to touch on. Well, three more things in actual fact. And I'm going to try to pack them in in ten minutes. I might go five minutes over. You can pause and uh, get yourself some water. And then restart the video at your own uh, your own leisure. Um, I want to talk. Okay, so all right, so let me start with Joe Casta, the character of Joe Casta. Um, and what I want to talk about here, and this is purely this is purely interpretive. This is not um, this is not. Not everybody would agree with me on these things. So you're gonna about to get my take on Jocasta and her character in Oedipus the King. She's not the same everywhere she appears in Greek myth. Things change. I'm just dealing with Sophocles' portrayal of her. And the kind of the main question that comes up surrounding the character of Jocasta, and I think probably the main question that most people have, is how did she not know? How, like, how, like, how did she not know? Now, first of all, you have to remember, when, when she, damn it, when, jo, when Jocasta marries Oedipus, she has to be thought of as, at a minimum, at a minimum, of 15 or, or 16 years older than he is. Okay. Um, and probably more realistically, somewhere in the range of 18 to 22 years older than he is. So that's one thing, uh, is the age difference. The second thing is, like, I think mean, most people, I, I mean, I don't know how true it is or not. Like, I, I mean, I've read stories about brothers who uh, meet each other and become friends and don't even discover their brothers until they take DNA tests 30 years later, that kind of thing. So it's easy to kind of just default and say, how would you not know? Who you're, like, how could you not know who your son is? All right, fair, you know, one way or the other. With that, that's kind of feeble evidence. Um, the, but again, I mean, Oedipus walks with a limp. Um, and that should be a tell. And then there's the whole part where Oedipus tells his whole backstory to Jocasta. And the oracle that Oedipus get, says that he got from, from Apollo at Delphi happens to exactly match the oracle that Jocasta and Elias were given from the from Delphi, from Apollo, before Oedipus was born. That piece of evidence is a little bit harder to ignore. So, how do, how, how do I filter Jocasta and Jocasta's characters? I think of Jocasta as being in uh, denial, uh, or you know, cognitive dissonance, right? There's an unpleasant truth, uh, and she doesn't want to deal with that unpleasant truth, so she allows herself to go on with her life um, without acknowledging the unpleasantness of that truth. How can I how 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 can I support that argument from the text itself? Because there's no interpretation. Uh, that is worthwhile if it can't be supported from the text itself. Well, for me, there's there's a couple of things. The primary piece of evidence has to do with Jocasta and her um, acceptance of the truth of prophecy. So Oedipus is born. She believes the prophecy is true, so she gets rid of the baby. Lias gets married and she marries the dude who murdered him. Okay, no, there's no reason to think except for his limp uh, and and probable, one would imagine, resemblance to his father and mother, for that matter, that that uh, 
you know, there's no reason. But then there's this thing that she does with respect to prophecy. Oedipus, when Oedipus confesses his, uh, uh, why he left Corinth and why he came to Delphi, uh, Jocasta says to Oedipus, hey, don't, don't worry about it. Prophecy doesn't mean anything. Look, we got this prophecy that said that, like, I was going to have a son who was going to kill his dad and, you know, have kids with me. And that never came true because we killed the son. So prophecy is not true. Just forget about it. That's after the that's in the scene that comes after the argument with uh, Creon and, and, and Oedipus, and you also notice too, like when Creon and Oedipus get into their argument, who stops the argument? Jocasta comes out of the castle, right, and says, "Hey, you two, calm down." She's like a mom in a playground, right, with two kids who are fighting over a toy in a sandbox. You go stand over there. You go stand over there. Do 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 do. Tell, tell me what's wrong. It's a very kind of mother. Thing happening there. But again, circumstantial. What I'm trying to do is compile circumstantial evidence to make my argument. Uh, so she, she tells Oedipus after that that prophecy isn't true. But the very next time she comes on stage, she tells us, oh, I'm going to the temple of Apollo to make offerings. What? Like you just told us that prophecy wasn't true, and now you're going off to the temple where prophecy is true. And then even then, when after jo after that scene happens, uh, Jocasta even knows way before Oedipus does. In actual fact, everybody knows before Oedipus does. Everybody knows before Oedipus does. So this is going to bring us back to our concept of irony and the, the relationship between irony and knowledge in this play. I'm going to write it on this sheet, too, because I've already put notes on this sheet, too. So, okay. So, what is irony? Irony is a notoriously difficult thing um, to uh, explain. It's, well, not explain. I mean, I, to me, it's a very easy thing to understand. Irony is a gap. It's the gap between what somebody on stage or on screen knows or means when they say or do something. Between what we know So that's the irony gap. It's the difference between what a character on stage, screen, or on the page, as you read it, means when they say something, and what we understand when they say it. So in the early part of the play, when Oedipus says, or when the priest says to Oedipus, you're the greatest in all men's eyes, well, yeah, at one level that just means everybody looks at you as being the best, right? But we know the myth, and we know that Oedipus is going to end up without having any eyes. So we see the, we get the irony there. See the gap, there's, a, there's that gap between what that character intends from his perspective, and but what we as an audience understand from our perspective. Same thing with Oedipus when he says, I'll, I'll, I'll search for this killer. I'll search for this killer as if I was looking for the killer of my own father. Right? Noble pledge. But what we know at the same time is that he is looking for the killer of his father. And what's even bigger is that he's the killer of his father. So there's tons and tons and tons of irony here. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I promise you this is this will be the last thing I talk about. Okay, uh, so what we have here is uh, Sophocles employs a series of images throughout this play, a series of metaphors. 
that on the one level we're used we're kind of used to and even the like these are universal human metaphors i would imagine but certainly they were they were uh they worked the same for us as they worked for the ancient greeks right so on the one hand you have these you have these images right dark and blind light and sight throughout the play uh, people tell Oedipus leave it in the dark leave it in the dark don't bring it to light right and then in probably the best example here for the uh, blind and sight thing is the argument between Oedipus and Tiresias where Oedipus says, well, you're blind, you can't see anything. And Tiresias says, I might be physically blind, but you're blind to the truth. Um, and they go back and forth, you know, with those sorts of insults. So usually we associate states of knowledge with the metaphors of sight and light. Bring it to light so we can know it. Oh, I see. Oh, I see. Right? That means I under I get you, I understand, I know what you're saying, right? Oh, I see. Right. Oh, now I see the truth. Now I see what you're after. Right. So sight and light, we generally associate metaphorically with states of knowledge. Conversely, blindness and darkness we associate with states of ignorance. Oh, I was in the dark about that. Oh, I was blind to that truth. Right? So those are metaphors that we use quite commonly. The interesting thing in Oedipus the King is that, ironically, back to irony, Sophocles reverses these things. Okay, let me do a little better job here. So we're talking about irony and knowledge. When we look at when we when we think about the way things, when we look at the, the way that Sophocles, the people, oh, sorry, da da da, ha. Huh. You start this thought over again. I'm getting excited because I'm almost done. Uh, he uses blindness and darkness as people who are in states of knowledge, whereas the people who can see are in states of ignorance. Now think about this for a second. Who is the last person to figure out Oedipus's identity? Oedipus is. Everybody knows, or at least knows more than Oedipus does before Oedipus knows it. So you look at Tiresias. Who's Tiresias? He has knowledge, but he's blind. But he knows who Oedipus is, despite his blindness, despite being in the dark. When Jocasta finally, A, either realizes or B, allows herself to admit it to herself, who Oedipus is, what does she do? She plunges into the darkness of death. Oedipus. When Oedipus finally figures things out, what does he do? He blinds himself. So this is an ironic reversal, where normally we think of Knowledge is to sight as ignorance, ignorance is to blindness. Well, it's, exa it's ironically reversed here, where knowledge is to blindness as ignorance is to sight in this, in this play. So I often talk about, when I talk about Sophocles and his, and his employment of irony, uh, I compare it to the way that kimchi is made. Um, some of you might know this, some of you might not. Kimchi is the... Uh, it's a pickled uh, delicacy, Korean pickled delicacy. It's delicious. Um, and uh, I'd have some in my fridge, but... Um, uh, so uh, what you do is you take the... You chop up the cabbage and the carrots and the potatoes and <clears throat> whatever else you can put in it, and the vegetables you're going to put in it. Put it into this uh, spicy brine, and you seal it up, and then you bury it. And then a few months later... I mean, you bury it, you put it in the earth, and then a few months later, you go and you dig it up, and only it's only after a few months that everything has become fully pickled, 
in all the spices have gone, you know, it's ready, it's fermented also too. Um, and uh, um, that's kind of how I feel about Sophocles and Oedipus the King. I feel as if he took this pre-existing myth. Now remember, this myth of Oedipus has already been around for centuries, okay? At least at least 500 years, at least 500 years, probably longer than that. And, um, and he just like sort of put it in this jar of irony and he just buried it <laughs> and then dug it up because there's, all, there's everything, all kinds of ironies at work um, over the course of this text. Okay, let me look quickly back here over my uh, scrambled notes and make sure. Remember, we're talking about knowledge in this play, knowledge of yourself, and how terrible it is to know yourself. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, so, all right. One last thing, promise, 30 seconds. I'll get right through this. Coming back here to the name Oedipus. I talked about his name meaning swollen foot, but there's another thing here. The Eid in Oedipus can also equally be read, be read as related to the Greek verb oida. That verb means I see or alternately, depending on its context, I know. So, there you go. That's Oedipus the King. Um, um, I hope I'm going to get this video up, and I think that's about all I have to say. So, bye.